lifting up Jesus and opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, the United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. Chapter 1, verse 10. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you agree and there be no divisions among you, but you shall be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. He begins with the polemic against division. And he speaks of people being of the same mind and the same judgment. When people are not of the same mind and the same judgment, there will be a barrier to fellowship. Now there's two aspects of this. The first aspect is what he continues with in this chapter, verse 11. For I've been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? The name of the ministry I work with is called Moriel. In Hebrew it means, God is my teacher. God is your teacher. One is our teacher who was in heaven. Paul commended the ministry of the other apostles and of Apollos. Peter commends the ministry of Paul. Something begins to happen. A kind of division comes about when leaders form personality cults. This may be at their initiation, but usually it begins by others putting them on a pedestal and then standing forward and allowing it to happen. The personality cult begins to develop. I'm this one's, I'm that one's, who's your pastor, who's your leader, who do you look to? The best contemporary example of this problem is what happened in the Restoration Churches in the 1980s. It was always, who's your apostle? I've got this apostle, I've got that apostle. So you began not following the Lord directly, but you began following a man. And you had to go through him to get to the Lord. Now, we don't want to go into it now. It connects with Gnosticism and all sorts of other things we've already dealt with on other tapes. But when you begin seeing this happen, when someone's relationship with the Lord and their capacity to fellowship or relate to other Christians is tied to some one leader, that will be a barrier to New Testament fellowship. It will always be a barrier to New Testament fellowship. Sometimes it's the leader's fault, but even when it isn't, he should not allow himself to be put on that kind of a pedestal by people. Paul never did that. The apostles never did that. But there are people who do it today. Now let's look at this. I'm of this one. I am of that one. Galatians calls it the sin of party spirit. The sin of party spirit. Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. It is a deed of the flesh. That is, it is an opposite to the fruit of the Spirit. What is party spirit? Denominations are one thing. Denominationalism is another. Denominationalism is the barrier to fellowship. Let me explain the difference. When you have a group of Christians, or a group of churches, that are, as in verse 10, the same mind and the same judgment, that is, a group of congregations who have the same doctrinal emphasis, the same doctrinal convictions, and they form some kind of an association because they can work better in fellowship with each other than they can independently, well, that's not a problem. The Assemblies of God, the Baptist Union, these things began not as denominations, but they began as a fellowship of fellowships, each congregation being autonomous. 
The idea of the association or the movement was that the movement would be a servant of the local congregations. As long as the central movement is the servant of the individual congregations, there's not a problem. But once things become centralized to the point where they get hierarchical, and the local congregations lose their autonomy and become subservient to the central organization, that's denominationalism. A denomination or a movement may be, may be a good servant, but it's a bad and sometimes a very dangerous master. And it's begun to happen. So many of the mainstream movements in contemporary Britain, America, Australia, which began as movements, have become denominations and denominationalistic. It's okay if it's a servant, but once it becomes a master, you begin to have problems. The autonomy of the congregation certainly goes, but then some other thing happens. People begin falling into partyism, making a league not of God's spirit, party spirit. Exclusivism. So, you have a problem. Again, that you be of the same mind and judgment. Denominations were fine when they sprang up to separate true believers from false ones and from faithful churches from unfaithful ones. Okay? When you have a group of theocrats sitting down and decide to make a movement, that's not how God raises up a movement. The Assemblies of God, the Brethren, the Baptists, the Methodists, they evolved out of a situation that God brought about. It just happened because God did something. And the organization was only formed to facilitate what God had already done. It wasn't people setting out to construct some kind of an empire. Okay? didn't begin that way. Sometimes they ended that way, but that's not how they, how they began. That you be of the same mind in judgment. Well, the mainstream churches in John Wesley's day, the, the national church, went away from the principles of, of the Reformation and so on and the gospel. So the Methodists said, we're going to put it back. The brethren came to restore the gospel, the Baptists to restore the gospel, the Pentecostals came to restore things which they felt the church had lost, gifts of the spirit, premillennialism, and so on. Now, as long as these movements existed to unite true believers, they were good. But once they begin to divide true believers from each other, they are bad. That's the first aspect. When you get into a personality cult and begin following a man, when the servant becomes a master. And thirdly, when instead of separating true believers from false believers, it separates true believers from each other. Those things will always be barriers to fellowship. Now the other side of the coin is this. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 19. I don't want to dwell on it. We've talked about it many times in other tapes, but it is the other side of the coin. There must be factions among you in order that those who are approved may have become evident among you. There must be factions among you to prove which is true. This word for factions is heresy. Heresy, heresy is meant to bring division. Okay? That's a division that's of God. That's a division that's of God. The Reformation was a necessary division for all of its faults and mistakes. I think we need a Reformation today. I think the best thing that can happen to some of the mainstream churches and denominations would be a split. I don't simply think a split is acceptable. I think if evangelical Christianity is to survive, there must be a split in movements like Assemblies of God, Baptists, etc. It's, 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 it's not only desirable or permissible, it's even necessary. That's the kind of split that God wants. When? When heresy comes. So that those, in chapter 1, verse 10, are of the same mind and judgment, can continue with the truth. Let the others go. Okay. Either way, if either happens, you're going to have a barrier to fellowship. If you have the party spirit, the denominationalism, 
the servant becoming the master, okay, you're going to have a barrier to fellowship. On the other hand, if you have an artificial basis of unity, where you say that even though we don't have the same mind and the same judgment, we're going to be united anyway. That I'm going to stay in the same church with people who teach things that are heretical. That is also a barrier to fellowship. That is also a barrier to fellowship. People will take what Paul says in chapter 1 about let there be no division, but they will somehow forget what Paul says in chapter 11. Epistles are letters and they have to be read as a letter. If someone sent you a letter, you couldn't take one excerpt of what the person said in isolation from the rest of the things in the letter because you wouldn't understand what the person is saying. Well, so it is when we read the epistles. You cannot take one thing that Paul says in isolation from what he's saying in the overall letter. You've got both sides. The visions that are acceptable and the visions which are not. Those that are of God and the ones that aren't. When you have cause for a division that is of God and you don't do it, you're going to have a barrier to real fellowship. Because the believers are not going to be of the same mind and judgment. Look at the Assemblies of God, my, my church. How fragmented it is between the Link Movement and the others that have gone with all this hype and all this. It's just fragmented. The Baptist Union is fragmented. Fragmented. These movements are getting more and more fragmented. The Church of England, it's, how can you call it a single church? I know true believers in the Church of England and I know atheists. Virtual atheists. How, are they of the same mind and judgment? No. There could be no fellowship. They should be split. Okay. The visions that are right and the visions that are wrong. Now, a right division will always have to do with doctrine, not personality. With upholding truth and righteousness. A right division will have to do with upholding truth and righteousness. A wrong division will have to do with personality conflict. A right division will have to do with upholding truth and righteousness. A wrong division will have to do with personality conflict. I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Derek Prince, I'm of Jacob Pratt, I'm of this one, I'm of that one. That's not of God. Let's continue. Second barrier to koinonia found in 1 Corinthians. Continuing in chapter 1, let's begin in verse Twenty six. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to disgrace the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to disgrace the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen the things that are not, that he might nullify the things that are, that no man should boast before God. And just before this, he begins talking about Jews and Greeks. Now, in the ancient world, the Greeks were the intellectuals. Everybody who was anything was a Greek. Mathematics, Pythagoras, Euclid, they were Greeks. Philosophy, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, they were Greeks. Medicine, Herodotus, was a Greek. Recorded history, academic study of history, hip, right? Uh, Hippocrates, sorry, medicine, Hippocrates, was a Greek. Herodotus' history was a Greek. Literature, Aesop, was a Greek. Homer was a Greek. Anybody who was anything was a Greek. Even when Rome conquered the known world, they looked for their culture to Greece. By choosing the Jews, a little nation, seen as foolish in the eyes of the world, never a main power like Rome or Babylon, never a main power like, like Media Persia or Egypt, never having the cultural influence of the Greeks or the Babylonians or the Egyptians, never having any of that, God chooses something that would seem foolish. Even in the days of Solomon and David. Israel was nothing more than a regional power. Even at its absolute peak, at its imperial peak in the Old Testament, it was still only a regional power. It never approximated anything like the Roman Empire or, the, or, the, or Alexander the Great's Empire or the Babylonian Empire. God chooses the foolish. 
But then Paul takes this, which happens with God's election of Israel, and he begins saying, well, look at the church, it's the same way. As I pointed out many times, any true move of God's Spirit, what people might call a revival, has always seen the gospel prosper among the poor, the working classes, and the socially disenfranchised. The biggest revivals today in Latin America. Where are they happening? In the barrios, the slums around the big cities like Mexico City and Sao Paulo. Absolutely astronomical growth. Here in England, in the early days of the Industrial Revolution, it was Wesley's Methodists. It was the people in the collieries, the, the mining pit towns. Things like this, where there was a lot of social injustice, there was a sweatshops, exploitation in the factory towns of England. These cities sprung up and the conditions were abhorrent. Yet that is where Wesley's message blossomed. I don't want to go into it now, but I've said a number of occasions publicly, one of the reasons, one of the reasons the charismatic renewal has not seen revival come is because it has been sociologically a middle class phenomenon. Unlike the Methodists who took educated middle class people and made them servants of the working classes, that has not happened with the charismatic movement. It has largely been something that was confined to the middle classes to which the working classes and the people in council estates never had much part. Early Pentecostalism thrives among the poor uneducated. Okay. Now, we have to deal with this subject. The second barrier to fellowship, the koinonia, class division in the church. Class division in the church. In a country like England, where class structure is endemic to this basic social fabric, this can become quite a problem. And as the epistle James warns about not looking down upon the people who don't have nice clothes to wear at the church on Sunday, or <laughs> whatever, on Saturday, whatever. Okay. When people begin to organize themselves on the basis of class, there is a problem. Now, Paul looks at this in two ways. Consider your calling. Not many of you were sophisticated people in the world. That's one aspect. The other is the Jew-Gentile aspect. These people have different cultures. Different people have different cultures. And as Paul later says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, you have to evangelize people within their own culture. Look what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 19, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, that I might win the more. To the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those under the law as under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law, as without the law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ. In other words, he was not an antinomian. That I might win those who are without the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men that I may save some. The Greco-Roman world in which Paul operated was highly structured on the basis of class. There was the emperor, the senate, the nobility, the aristocracy, the generals in the army, then the army, then the free men, the citizens, then the citizens and, the, and then the slaves. And the slave population was astronomical. Something like 25 or 30 percent of the overall population. But the gospel had to be taken to all of these. A barrier to fellowship will be where people fail to cross the cultural barrier for the sake of the gospel. Paul, as a Jew, crossed it to reach Gentiles. As a Roman citizen, he crossed it to reach those who were in countries occupied by Rome. The servant mentality. Trying to force people of another culture to conform to yours in order to become Christian. In fact, biblically, the opposite is what God mandates. That the people who have the gospel cross the barrier to reach the others. 
You know, don't ask me how it happened. It took years and years and years for some people who were not gypsies to finally manage to get the gospel into the gypsy caravan camps. It took them years for that to happen. But when it happened, it really happened. Chinese people are different than Anglo-Saxons. Jews are different than Gentiles. Black people are different than white people. Asian people are different than Westerners. But there's something in common with all of them. They need the gospel, and we have it. Acculturation. The failure to acculturate, to take the servant mentality, will be a barrier to fellowship. You just look. What segments of society are open to the gospel? Forget about the church growth formulas that come from Fuller Seminary and all that, and the Peter Wagner stuff. It doesn't work and it's not scriptural. It discounts the sovereignty of God. But let's look. Gypsies are open. Catholics are more open than Protestants. Single parents. You know how many single mothers there are in council estates? You look at churches that begin mom and toddlers groups and use them evangelistically to reach single mothers. You have to go to where the rain is falling. If you want to get some water. If you want to get some harvest, you've got to go to where it's ready and ripe. But that requires people crossing a divide. If people are not willing and ready to cross a divide, there'll be a barrier to fellowship. There'll be a barrier to fellowship. Staying within, well, this is a working class church, this is a middle class church, this is an Anglo-Saxon church. Paul had a Jewish gospel. Where would the Gentile nations be if he said, well, this is ours, but then the probably rest of them. It just doesn't work that way in God's economy. It works that way in our mentality, but not in God's. This will always be a barrier to fellowship. The failure of a church to cross the class divide and accommodate people of a different culture. But now, there's the other aspect, the economic one. Or the one to do with education. That's what Paul is saying. Not many of you were people who were sophisticated. Not many of you were people who, as it were, were of privileged birth. And in that context, privileged birth and education went hand in hand. Okay. Now, even here it's like that. Very much a class structure. Just look at England. You can get somebody who was born in a council estate in Liverpool or Sheffield, and that person could stay in school and do GCSEs or O-levels and then A-levels, and then go to university. And that person could become successful in a profession. Okay. But because they were not born into the right class in England, they can only get so far. They can cross one class barrier, they can go from being working class to middle class, or maybe upper middle class, but no further. Somebody like Princess Diana, she didn't even have an O-level. She can get everywhere because of the way people were born. Okay. Now, up until not too long ago, up until not too long ago, if you were not born, in, if your parents didn't go to university, you wouldn't either in England. Very few people would have gone to university if their parents didn't, up until probably the 1960s, began to change that. Okay. Well, it was a lot like that in Corinth. In, in fact, the whole Roman Empire was a lot like that. Simple people, uneducated people, will always respond to the gospel faster than the ones who are people of means, position, and education in the world. The simple will get saved faster. The uneducated will be more likely to get saved. Now, can you say that, well, because people are uneducated, they're not savable? <laughs> it's not true. However, look at Acts chapter 13. I'm sorry, Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Now, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were marveling and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. 
people may be uneducated when they get saved. It's more likely that an uneducated person will get saved. But once they do get saved, they're not supposed to stay that way. The influence of the gospel tends to make people upwardly mobile. They observe the confidence. Where did these uneducated men get this knowledge, this wisdom, that they can stand against the religious intelligentsia of their day? Because they had been with Jesus. I look at my own movement, Pentecostalism. The first generation of Pentecostals had very few scholarly people, very few knew anything about Greek or Hebrew. But they knew their doctrine. They knew why they were premillennial. They knew why they were not cessationists. They knew their doctrine, but they weren't learned men. Even the leaders weren't learned men. But after a while, the second generation, you look at people in England, America, you look at Ivan Morgan and, and, and John Whitfield Foster and, and, and David Powell and Aaron Linford, these were not unlearned men. These were not unlearned men. Now, unfortunately, popular Pentecostalism has begun to disintegrate and the, the men have become unlearned again. The, the current generation have, it went like this and it went down again. They don't know the Bible anymore and they don't know too much else. Quite unfortunately, that's what's tended to happen. This pseudo-spirituality. Now, an intellectual faith is useless. There's no shortage of professors in universities with doctorates in divinity or theology who aren't saved. They can tell you all about higher criticism, but they can't tell you anything about salvation. They don't know. It's all here. It is not here. On the other hand, once God puts it here, he expects us to have it here. When you see people saying, we don't need this, we don't need learning, we don't need doctrine, we don't need to know, we don't need to teach our ministers Greek or Hebrew, we don't need... What that really is are people who have not been with Jesus. When you see people failing to become literate and biblically literate, after they get saved, no matter how poor or uneducated they may have been, if you fail to see people become upwardly mobile in, the, in their understanding of their faith, that tells you that those people have not been with Jesus. They may have made some profession of faith or gotten saved or joined some movement or some church, but when people are with Jesus, they're going to become more clever. They're going to become more knowledgeable of God's Word. Again, look at the gypsies. Most of them couldn't read or write until after they got saved. Once they got saved, they wanted to read the Word of God, and you'll find middle-aged people learning to read or write. Why? Because they've been with Jesus. When you have an intellectual faith, it is abject. When you have a faith that is void of intellectual credibility, that is also abject. Paul says our faith is reasonable. There's apologetics that can be argued for, it can be contended for rationally. Ours is not a blind faith. Our faith is based on reason, reality. Again, it'll be a barrier to fellowship. When you find an intellectual faith, it'll be a barrier to fellowship. And when you find a faith that lacks intellectual credibility, it'll be a barrier to fellowship. Either way, koinonia is suppressed. Now look at a church. In the early church, it was not uncommon for somebody who was a slave to be an elder in the church and his owner or master would be a member. Not uncommon. Today we have this tendency. Well, he's a businessman in the community and he's just gotten saved. Make him an elder. He's a dentist, he's an engineer, he's a doctor, he's a lawyer. He's a professor. Make him an elder. Somehow we put the world's standards. That's wrong. But the yobo mentality in the church, stupid and proud of it, that's not God either. And it is quite prevalent today. Not only the basis of the class, you'll find that the charismania, the middle class charismatics, <laughs> 
They're as biblically as illiterate as anybody. Barriers to fellowship. Let's continue. Chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. Verses 13 to 15. Which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts and spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are appraised spiritually. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no man. I don't want to go into slagging things off or, or, or standing against errors that we've already addressed and people know certainly what I believe about things like Toronto and all this. But as a point in passing, there was one particular video where Rodney Brown said, don't try to understand this with your natural mind, this, this, this behavior. The natural mind does not understand the things of the spirit. Now notice what he did. He replaced the word man with the word mind. <laughs> Christians are not natural men. Natural men are unsaved. We're called to be supernatural men. The first thing he did was he replaced the word man with the word mind. Remember, Satan manifests himself as an angel of light, doesn't he? And what did Satan do in Matthew 4, or in, uh, with, with the woman in Genesis 3? He twisted Scripture out of context. When you see people doing that, taking texts out of context, as I've said many times, it is the signature of Satan. Change one word, he gives the whole text a different meaning. And people just come up and swallow it. The second thing he did was separate it from the following verse. Verse 15, he who is spiritual appraises all things. Now, you may have heard John on it. Don't try to test it. Don't try to judge it. Just experience it. Then you'll know it's of God. <laughs> when you find people failing to discern, the word here is diakrino in Greek. When you find people failing to analyze things on the basis of Scripture, where things are just accepted, where things are not properly analyzed, where things are not investigated, that is going to cause a barrier to real fellowship. If there's no discernment, there's no koinonia. No discernment, no koinonia. Now today, if somebody comes and is discerning, if somebody comes and tries to look at these things on the basis of God's Word and say, wait a minute, the fruit of the Spirit is a krete, self-control. He's a Pharisee. He's, he's, he's got a wrong spirit. He's not in fellowship with us. He's <laughs> well, he's not the one who's out of fellowship. To be in fellowship, you must be, first of all, in fellowship with the Lord. And if you're out of harmony with his word, you're not in fellowship with him. Therefore, we cannot have proper fellowship with each other. Koinonia is not there. What you see today is not koinonia. Again, being of the same mind and judgment. When you see people doing these crazy things, there's no judgment of it. <laughs> I don't think they're in their mind either. It must be on that basis. If there is a lack of discernment in a fellowship, there will not be fellowship. There will be something else masquerading as fellowship, but there won't be fellowship. An absence of discernment means an absence of koinonia. Chapter 4, verse 6. 1 Corinthians 4, 6, please. I have no intention of dealing with the subjects of inner healing or deliverance or any of this stuff. We have other tapes dealing with binding and loosing. If you want those tapes, they're available on the back. It's not our purpose to go into it today. We just want to look at the aspect of a barrier to fellowship in verse 6 of chapter 4. These things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sake, that in us you might learn not to exceed what is written, in order that no one of you might become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. Apostolic example. 
Notice the apostles taught by what they did, not just by what they said. Their lives and their example met their words. Okay. That you may learn in us. And they warn about people becoming arrogant against one another. Who will become arrogant against one another? Those who exceed the things that are written. A barrier to fellowship will always come about when the things that are written are exceeded in a congregation. As a result of that, those who are exceeding the things written will become arrogant against others who don't go along with it. Try challenging someone who sold out to ideas of generational curses, binding and loosing, inner healing, deliverance. Try challenging, or even the, the, the laughing thing. Try challenging, look how angry they get. Self-assured. When people exceed what is written, real fellowship will not happen and they'll become arrogant. Now, what happens when you begin to exceed what is written? When you begin to exceed what is written, when that becomes your emphasis in your fellowship, the things that are written are downplayed. You begin to replace what is written with what is not. Thus, koinonia does not take place. In the United States, there are Pentecostal churches who do not call themselves churches or fellowships or congregations or tabernacles. They literally call themselves deliverance centers. And the entire basis of their meetings when they come is casting demons, or so they imagine, out of Christians. That's what becomes the focus of it. Well, if you try to build a whole church on that kind of practice, you're not going to practice what is written. And the same goes on with the binding and loosing and the, the, the going, pushing people down. All this stuff exceeds what is written. So much of the popular practice you see happening in contemporary charismatic and Pentecostal circles exceeds what is written. So that becomes emphasized, therefore the things that are written are downplayed. What you wind up with is something other than koinonia. The fellowship becomes dominated by things not in the Word of God, so the things that are in the Word of God, that should be focal and central to our worship and fellowship, are not there. Other things have taken their place. And with it comes a tide of almost unbelievable arrogance. Now, in his infinite wisdom, the Lord saw this, and through the apostles warned about it. But this is the nature of the way things have become. When things that are written are exceeded, it is inevitable that koinonia will face a barrier. And until and unless those barriers are removed, there will be no koinonia. Chapter 5. Verses 1 to 3. It's actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. And you've become arrogant and have not mourned, instead in order that the one who has done this thing might be removed from your midst. For I am my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. We'll come back to this point when we get to chapter 11, Lord willing. But when you have immorality in a fellowship, remember we're one body. When you have immorality in a fellowship, it will always present a barrier to fellowship. Again, Paul later in Corinthians describes the church as a physical body. A toothache can be a terrible thing. Say you had an infected root canal, right? Would it matter to you how good your feet feel with your new trainers? Of course it wouldn't. Of course it wouldn't. Of course it wouldn't. Say my vision is really improved with my new reading glasses. Unfortunately, my ulcer is burning, but I'm really enjoying my... <laughs> it just doesn't work that way, does it? Well, so it is with a body. If someone is hurting in the body, legitimately hurting, 
again, the rest of the body shouldn't be too able to be so obsessed with its own pleasure that it ignores the one who's being hurt. I'm just told that a, a musician, a drummer, lost his mother. I don't know if she was saved or not. Well, that should affect the whole body. But so should sin. If there is serious immorality in a fellowship, it will affect fellowship. It will affect it. Now, look what happens. Once again, you've become arrogant. Verse 2, chapter 5, verse 2. When people exceed things which are written, it will cause arrogance. When people fail to uphold things that are written, that will also produce arrogance. You exceed what's written, you're going to find arrogance. You don't fulfill what is written, you're going to find arrogance. Now let's go down to verse 9 of this chapter. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world, or with the covetous, or the swindlers, or the idolaters. For then you'd have to go out of the world. But actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother, if he should be an immoral person, covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. What have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? Now again, I don't want to go into it, but the covetous. Faith, prosperity, teaching, that's simply the sin of covetousness masquerading as Christianity. Faith in faith, not faith in Jesus. The Bible says if these people don't repent, don't even associate with them. Don't say they're a brother, they're a so-called brother. These money preachers are so-called brothers, they're not brothers. If the church fails to uphold these standards, you're going to have a barrier to fellowship. Fellowship can only take place on the basis of holiness. Holy unto the Lord. Uh, now you have to look at the context of 1 Corinthians. Corinth was a highly immoral society. Highly immoral. Rome imported much of its decadence across the Peloponnese Peninsula from Corinth. It was the center, of, certainly, of cult prostitution and things like that, socially acceptable bisexuality, but also violence as entertainment. The gladiators, the blood-gorging violence entertainment, came from Corinth. That's where the gladiator thing came from. This place was like, was like the Amsterdam or the Las Vegas of its day, I suppose. Paul says, however, that the stuff happening in the church that you wouldn't even find among these pagans. Well, I'll tell you. I've seen things happening in, in some of our churches that our unsaved people wouldn't do. I've seen things happening in Christian churches that I wouldn't find in Amsterdam or Las Vegas. I, if God doesn't judge places like Amsterdam, he owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. But I've seen things in the church that unsaved people wouldn't do. It's true. A barrier to fellowship. Now the reason people don't want to stand up and take issue with immorality, it will disturb our unity. We'll lose people. We'll, we'll, you know, it will upset the unity. It will upset us having fellowship. <laughs> the opposite is true. The opposite is true. Stop the toothache. Deal with the sin. Then you can have real fellowship. The rest of the body isn't going to be able to enjoy itself if you have a toothache. Well, the rest of the congregation isn't going to be able to get on with it when there's something fundamentally wrong morally. Yet, you know, the things, the stuff, the, I cannot believe. I, you know, when I was first saved, I would never believe a day would come when you would see born-again Christians getting divorced and remarried and being accepted in the church. Now ministers are even doing it. Our ministers are even doing stuff like that. And nobody says anything about it sometimes. Nobody. And if you do, you hit them with the problem. What do we have to do with judging outsiders? Nothing. He says we judge the ones inside the church. Not our judgment, of course, but God's. When moral standards are not upheld, you are going to have a barrier to fellowship. A barrier to koinonia will become inevitable. 
chapter 6, verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but I will not be mastered by anything. Agape love always puts self last. It puts God first, others second, beginning with our families, and then ourselves last. I go to an Assemblies of God church, albeit one that's on its way out of the Assemblies of God, but I still go to it's, it, we're still in it, barely. And in my church, we take the Lord's Supper with grape juice. Or it's non alcoholic wine. It was fermented, but the alcohol was taken out. That's in my church. Okay? However, sometimes I speak in brethren churches. Sometimes I speak in Anglican churches. And they take the Lord's Supper with wine, actual wine. Now, although it's not what we do in my church, when I go to their church, I don't have a problem with taking the Lord's Supper with the wine. In England, I have no problem going to a pub for lunch because the food is cheap, it's reasonably good, and it's reasonably fast, and you're in and out, bang, bang, three quid, and that's it. In the Celtic countries of Britain, Scotland, Ireland, I do not wish to be seen setting foot into a pub. Why? Because I have a problem eating lunch in a pub? No, I don't. But I understand the problems that alcohol causes in those societies. It should hurt my testimony. And there will be people in the church saved out of alcohol abuse backgrounds. So while it's nothing to me, I don't care about it. It's lawful. It is not helpful. It's not helpful. We go to a church located on a council estate. Single parent families, unemployed people, things like that. My wife and myself choose to go to a church like that because that's the reality of the spiritual climate of this country. That's where the real work is. If the revival is going to come, it's going to begin in places like that. Not in some church in the middle of a big city where they put on a show and think it's a revival when it isn't. It's going to have to... Righteousness will have to infiltrate the inner cities. And there are just things that are around there that are moral problems for people. I've got to watch it. I've got to watch it. The alcohol abuse is endemic. I couldn't uh, go to a church in a place like that, and, and uh, it would be wrong and, uh, for us to take the Lord's Supper with wine in a place like that, in my church. If we go to a different church, it's different. I'll do it. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't matter to me. I don't care about it. Lawful, helpful. We go to a messianic fellowship. We invite unsaved Jewish people. We just had a Hanukkah party and we invited a lot of unsaved Jews to come and they heard the gospel. And we served food. There was no pork. There was no shellfish. Lawful. I can eat bacon buddies as well as anybody. We can eat bacon. That doesn't matter. Lawful. But it's not helpful. These people think that Christianity is a Gentile religion and they don't identify it in any sense with its Jewish roots. You have to show a Jewish Jesus, a Jewish Yeshua, a Jewish Messiah, and you have to show Christianity within its original Jewish context. That's a servant spirit. When you find people failing to have that attitude, putting the good of others and putting their testimony before their own freedom, that's going to be a barrier to fellowship. For real fellowship to take place, you've got to put the good of others first. That certainly includes our testimony to the lost, but it also includes not putting a stumbling block before a brother or sister who may have had a problem with something. Okay? May have had a problem with something. If that attitude is not in each one of us, there's going to be a barrier to fellowship. Now again, you may come from a certain background where these things have never been problems or issues for you. 
But if you're going to try to reach people with the gospel in communities where there are problems and issues, what's going to come first? Our freedom or their good? Let's press on. Chapter 7, Paul deals with the issue of family and marriage. Family and marriage. And he devotes quite a bit to it. As I've said in other tapes, Marriage is the closest kind of fellowship that God has ordained. The fellowship that takes place in a church on a Sunday or a Wednesday or in a home group or a whatever is never going to be qualitatively better than the sum total of the fellowship that takes place in the families and married couples that compose it. Now, this is not in any way to alienate people who are not married, who are singles. Paul goes on to say single people have a particular advantage in the fellowship. But most people don't have the grace to be single. Now, the prayer time as a family. Praying with your husband, praying with your wife, family devotions, things like that, family Bible study. It is totally unreasonable to expect the fellowship that takes place in a congregation to be anything more or anything better than what it is in the family. It doesn't work that way. Cellular health, right? Cellular health makes systemic health and systemic health makes a healthy organism in, in medicine, right? begins with the cell group. Right fellowship within a family structure will be reflected in right fellowship within a church. You're not going to get right fellowship in a church if there's not right fellowship in a family and in a marriage. Now that's for married people. If there is a problem in a family or in a marriage where there is not Christian fellowship between a husband and wife, that's one of the reasons Paul warns about marriage to unbelievers. Well, that's going to affect the congregation. It's going to affect the body. Now, I've got a major problem. I have a sister in the States who's backslidden. 27, she prayed with me when she was 8 years old to receive Jesus, and she's backslidden. She would deny it, but her life shows she is, and she's going to marry somebody who's unsaved. She's just going to engage somebody who's unsaved. I'm absolutely devastated about it. I know what that's going to mean. I know what that causes. It's a problem. It's a big mess. But then there's a, another aspect for the single people. What about them? In this chapter, Paul talks about being single. When a brother or a sister has the grace to be single, they have an even better blessing than marriage. Now it says in Proverbs, says in Proverbs, he who finds a wife from the Lord finds a good thing. It's good to get married. But if you have the grace, it's better if you don't. I myself don't have the grace. Some people do, but I'll tell you what, my life with the traveling, especially in the family separation so often, would be a lot easier if I had the grace, but I don't have the grace. Be careful of people who will try to put celibacy on you. It's not simply a Roman Catholic problem. In the States, this guy Bill Gothard does the same thing. And people get hurt by it. Now look at this. If somebody has the grace to be single, their being single, or their being celibate, will contribute to the upbuilding of the fellowship. If somebody doesn't have the grace to be single, oh, poor Henry's been ironing his own shirts too long. Oh, poor Harriet, we've got to find her a husband. Again, these people, they become obvious that they don't have the grace to be single. When somebody has the grace to be single, it's because God has called them to a particular ministry. That being married 
their husband or wife wouldn't be a helpmate but a hindrance. A Bible smuggler for Brother Andrew, smuggling Bibles into Iran, doesn't need a wife or kids in Devonshire waiting for him to come home when he might not be coming home. <laughs> That's one extreme example. Okay. The call to particular ministry. Secondly, it does not affect their masculinity or their femininity. Women who have that grace do not lose their femininity, and males who have that grace do not lose their masculinity. But you look at these guys who don't have it, they get dainty in their old age. I'm not saying in the homosexual sense, but you see they get like old women. Third, they have a peace about it. They have, a, it doesn't bother them, it doesn't disturb them. Their, their sexuality isn't a problem, they're not so tainted by lust that they're burning with passion, it doesn't affect them that way. And it contributes to the upbuilding of the fellowship. If you don't have the grace to be single, it's better to marry, because you're going to find fellowship in a marriage. If you do have the grace to be single, don't get married. You're going to do more good for the fellowship by staying single, if you have the grace. But so concerning the things of fellowship, what happens in a family, what happens in a marriage, will directly impact what happens in a congregation. The fellowship of one will be played out in the greater fellowship of the other. We need to think of the church, of the local congregation, as more of an extended family than as the kind of social institution it has become. Chapter 8, Barriers to Fellowship. Concerning things sacrificed to idols. We know we all have knowledge, and knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. If anyone supposes he knows anything, he's not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he's known by him. Therefore, concerning things, eating things, sacrifice to idols. We know there's no such thing as an idol in the world, and there is no God but one. Elsewhere in Corinthians, Paul says other gods are demons, quoting from the book of Deuteronomy. For even if there are so-called gods in heaven, gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom all things, and we exist through him. However, not all men have this knowledge, but some being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. What Paul is talking about here is again our testimony and participating in things which are pagan. Not because they are pagan to us. Well, not because they have any substance spiritually in themselves. But because they cause us, or they cause us to cause others to think there is. Now, here it's eating food sacrificed to idols. This is a major problem now. I was just in the Republic of Ireland and there was a big deal when the President of Ireland took the Eucharist, the Communion, at a Protestant service. And it's all the newspapers, the front pages of the newspapers, the new President did something like this. Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. I have a few things against you. You put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols. Revelation 2.20 The woman Jezebel calls herself a prophetess. These my servants astray, eating things sacrificed to idols. The Hebrew term is avodat zera, idolatry. Icons, statues, graven images. The pagan Greeks would offer the food before a pagan image. Stretching as far east as into India, there is the belief in Vishnu, that the spirits of the gods impregnate the food and you consume it. In the cannibalism of um, Africa and East Asia, 
They don't just eat anyone, they eat people to derive a spiritual benefit from eating the flesh. Now in Corinthians, Paul is concerned with taking the Jewish concept of the Lord's Supper, deriving from the Hebrew Passover, which is a memorial, and giving it to Gentiles. But it would be very easy for Gentiles to confuse the Hebrew idea of a memorial with the pagan Greek ideas. Now, the Greeks had a philosopher named Aristotle. And Aristotle taught something known as accidents. It was based on a wrong view of science. His philosophy came from his physics. His view of physics, particles, and, and chemistry, believed that some things could change, as it were, on an atomic level. The Greeks knew about atoms. They didn't know about subatomic particles, but they knew about atoms. They had the word atmos, and they had the word element, stoichiae. They believed that an element, a stoichia, could change from one to another, but it would look the same, taste the same, and so on. Okay. Now, eventually, these Aristotelian ideas got into Christendom with a doctrine known as transubstantiation, where you lift the bread and wine before a graven image and say that it becomes transubstantiated, it becomes Jesus Christ incarnate. Then you pray to the bread and wine, and then you eat it. Now, such ideas have no relationship to the Jewish idea of Passover, from where the Lord's Supper really comes. These things, obviously, go to Aristotelian physics. They go to paganistic ideas and cannibalism, is what it comes to. In ecumenical unity, you have people agreeing to unite with the Roman Church when their central doctrine of the Mass requires this act of idolatry and idolatrous worship. The Old Testament prophets in the Book of Kings warned about those who sit at Jezebel's table. Remember? Sit at Jezebel's table and Jesus said, You tolerate the woman Jezebel who teaches my servants to eat food sacrificed to idols. I'm greatly discouraged greatly distressed by so many evangelical Christians who are accommodating with Roman Catholicism when it has a doctrine that is idolatrous. Fundamentally idolatrous. Now, they're talking about unity. And let's have fellowship and let's unite and let's get together. Unity has to take place in Christ. Not in idolatry. We're warned not to eat at Jezebel's table. We are warned not to participate in this kind of religious idolatry. We know that the bread and wine, look what Paul says, we, the idols not, we know that this is not Jesus Christ incarnate. We know that it's not his body and blood literally, in, in, in the physical sense as they believe. We know that this is rubbish. Matter of fact, it only came because of, of, of Aristotelian physics. When, 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 you know, Newtonian physics and then, and then, and, and Modern chemistry evolved. People knew it was all rubbish, but they, they, they kept the belief anyway, even though it was debunked scientifically. Okay. People know it's, it's, we know it's rubbish. I think even they know it's, at least their intellectual, their scholars know it's rubbish. We know it's nothing. Paul says we know these things are nothing. But if we partake of it, we're giving them the impression it's something, and we're pointing people towards idolatry. That's not fellowship. That's a barrier to fellowship. This whole ecumenical issue and the transubstantiation issue, they're going to become bigger and bigger and bigger. I was in Dublin some weeks ago, Dublin, Ireland, several weeks back, and the ex-Catholics were complaining. Ex-Catholics, people say that of Catholicism in Dublin, were complaining that last year in the March for Jesus, the evangelicals invited the Catholics to participate and the Catholics were carrying banners of Mary. It wasn't, it wasn't the ex-Catholics doing it. The ex-Catholics were against it. They said this was idolatry. But the others went along with it. You know, singing, they were singing the Grand Kendrick choruses and all this stuff, and, that's, and they were carrying the barriers of Banners of Mary. Mary and Mary. These issues are going to become bigger and bigger. They're going to become more pronounced as problems. More pronounced as problems. 
Remember, Catholic people tend to be more open to the gospel right now than Protestant people. They tend to be more open. I always ask this question, or usually, how many people are ex-Catholics who are here today? Do you have any ex-Catholics here today? A few. Okay. It's going to become a problem. When you begin accommodating this stuff, Paul says it's a barrier to fellowship. We cannot fellowship around the table of idolatry. Now, <coughs> in chapter 9, he talks about acculturation, which we've already dealt with. But let's turn to chapter 10. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren. Our fathers were all under the cloud. They all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food, and they all drank the same spiritual drink. They were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was the Messiah. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased. They were laid low in the wilderness. Now, these things happened as examples for us that we should not crave evil things as they also craved. They happened as examples to us. Look at 2 Timothy 3.16, please. All Scripture is inspired by God, profitable for us. But in its context, all Scripture mainly meant the Old Testament. Most of the New Testament was not yet written. Romans 15.4 Whatever was written in earlier times, the Tanakh, the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets, was written for our instruction, that through perseverance and encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. The Old Testament was written as much for the Church as it was for the Jews. And then Paul goes on to say, these things happen to the Jews that we wouldn't make the same mistakes. The church is nearly 2,000 years old, reckoning from the time of Pentecost. Okay. Nearly 2,000 years old. However, we fail to realize that the age of God's covenant dealings with Israel is twice that, 4,000. His covenant with Israel is ongoing. It's still ongoing today. Israel in Romans 11 is the root of the church, the reason. And God spent 2,000 years getting Israel ready for the church to be born. What Paul is saying is, if you fail to learn the lessons of the original fellowship, Israel, you're going to repeat those same mistakes. If we fail as the church to learn from the errors and from the victories and successes of Old Testament Israel were doomed to repeat those errors. Look at the book of Kings and Chronicles. What would happen? Repentance, revival, backsliding. Repentance, revival, backsliding. Good leaders, repentance. Bad leaders, backsliding. Look at the history of the church. The same exact thing. Same thing. Replays the same tragic, unfortunate patterns. Paul says that shouldn't happen. Look what happened to Israel. They were not ready for the coming of their own Messiah. They were scattered among the nations. They faced terrible, terrible persecution, Holocaust. Don't let that happen to you. Well, it's, <laughs> well that was going to happen to us. Only a faithful remnant of the Jews are ready for Jesus to come, and only a faithful remnant of the Christians are going to be ready for him to come back. There's going to be a great tribulation. It's going to happen to us. It's going to happen. And dynamically, it's always in some way happened to us. If we fail to learn the lessons of the existing fellowship, of the fellowship that was around 2,000 years before we were, we're going to repeat the mistakes of those fellowships. And it will be a barrier to fellowship. 
Look how many churches don't read the Old Testament. In Romans and in, in Timothy and Corinthians, Paul says, read the Old Testament so you won't make those mistakes. Look how many pastors only preach from the New Testament. The Old Testament is more than two-thirds of the Bible. Where should two-thirds of our reading be? But it's not. It's not. I know people who never... I, I know of ministers who never preach from the Old Testament and wouldn't know how to do it unless they took something out of context and applied it in some crazy way or something. Some of them wouldn't know how to do it. They wouldn't know how to do it. If we don't learn from Israel, we're going to wind up like Israel. It was nothing more than a faithful remnant who had it right and the same is going to happen with the church. A faithful remnant. That's all. A barrier to fellowship, forgetting the Jewish roots, forgetting the Hebrew roots, failing to read the Old Testament and to learn from the fellowship that preceded us. And it still exists. Koinonia and the barriers to it, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 6. For if a man does not, a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to have his head covered since he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed man was not created for women's sake, but women for, this, for man's sake. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. However, if the Lord neither, however, in the Lord, neither is the woman independent of the man, nor is the man independent of the woman. Notice verse 11. For as the woman originates from man, so also the man has his birth through the woman, and all things originate from God. Judge yourself. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head on covered. Now, I'm determined this day not to go around and reiterate things we've already said before on other tapes. We have a perfectly good tape. I think you might even be able to copy in the back. I'm not sure. Otherwise, you can order it called The Daughters of Zion. And we talk about the role of women in ministry. I don't want to go into all the detail of head coverings and women in ministry. Get the tape. We only want to deal with it insofar as it concerns our subject today. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I wish that you bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, that to the Messiah, that I might present you as a pure virgin. He's writing again, of course, to the same church in Corinth. Okay. But I'm afraid lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your mind should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to the Messiah. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom you have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Oh, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, sorry. Verses 1 through 4. 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4. Sorry, my error. Okay. Again, we have the tape, The Daughters of Zion. What he's doing here is he's taking what he says in, in, in Ephesians. The husband's the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Now, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says in, in verse 11, the woman is not independent of the man and the man not of the woman. The husband is not independent of his wife nor the wife of her husband. Because of the fall of man, because of the fallen state of man, because of Adam and because of Eve, men have become insensitive by their fallen nature and women have become hypersensitive. There, were always an, there was always an emotional and a psychological difference in God's design between men and women. But the fall has brought something upon us. 
Men have become insensitive and women have become hypersensitive. Males in a Christian marriage are reliant on female sensitivity. Men are reliant on female sensitivity. As I've said many times, when a husband and wife get saved, it's usually the wife who was saved first. If the wife gets saved, if the husband is saved first, it's easy for the woman to get saved. The wife usually gets saved quite easily, relatively, most of the time. But if the husband is unsaved and the wife gets saved first, it's more difficult to see the husband saved. Women are more sensitive. When a husband and wife pray for direction, it's usually the wife who hears from the Lord. Men are reliant on female sensitivity. A wife is a helpmate to a husband. And a man in ministry, his most important helpmate will be the one he's married to. Women, however, are reliant on male protection. Why? Because, again, the same sensitivity in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. The nature of women. Satan will seduce the church the way he just seduced Eve. And again, what did he do? Took Bible verses out of context and the rest of it. Women are much more sensitive to the leading of God's spirit, but they are much more vulnerable to spiritual seduction. Much more. And the church operates in the nature of a woman. That's why leadership is male. The same as a male in the church is reliant on female sensitivity, a female in the church is reliant on male protection. Protection. Okay. Now listen to the taste. I don't teach against women in ministry, and as long as it is in God's order, I don't even have a problem with women in leadership. To a degree. But when the senior leadership is male and women pastors and the senior thing is male, whether obvious or not obvious, it's not just that in title, the leader is a male. I know a number of churches where although in title, the leadership is a male, in reality, the leadership is female. Not by counseling or encouraging, but by manipulating and nagging, and he puts up with it. It's his fault. Now, when these things happen, it is rarely, rarely the fault of women. It is primarily the fault of the men for not taking responsibility. Women are security conscious, and they're insecurity conscious, and a woman wants security. And if they're not seen in a male, they will push him and get him to do this, that, and the other thing, the way that Sarah did with Abraham. You look in the Middle East to this day, the problem with Jew and Arab. It does not go back to 1967 or 1948. It does not even go back to Esau and Jacob. It goes back to Abraham not being the spiritual head of his marriage in that given instance. Okay. God bless Father Abraham and Mother Sarah. A barrier to fellowship. When the role of women is not exercised scripturally and in order. A woman sharing an exhortation, no problem, providing her head is covered. That is under the male leadership of her husband and the leadership of the church. Women uh, exercising gifts of the spirit, no problem, but the same rules apply. Women teaching doctrine to other women, no problem. To mixed meetings, that's a problem. Paul says, let the older one teach the younger ones. No problem in women's ministry. There are things that a woman is better at teaching women than a male teaching. It's better if it comes from another female. No problem. But once you begin seeing happening what's happening today, you're going to have a problem. The problem in the church of Corinth was that the mentality of the secular society was strongly infiltrating the church. It happened with the issue of food sacrifice to idols. It happened with attitudes towards marriage and morality. It happened in a lot of ways in Corinth. But it's the same thing now. Greeks had goddesses as well as gods. They had Athena and all this kind of stuff. And Diana, the mother image. You find this transmitted into things like the Eastern Orthodox Church, the same places in Greece where they had these temples to Athena and these goddesses. You'll see Greek Orthodox churches to marry 
And of course, in Catholicism, it's the same, basically the same. The Madonna image and the rest of it, and all this, again, is just a westernized version of the Hindu Mother Earth and Semiramis and the rest of it from Babylon. But this is the issue. The feminism of secular society is getting into the church. The feminism of secular society is getting into the church. You know, most things begin right. Often they begin with biblical principles. I always keep my political views separate from my Christian views. I think that's important. I don't think it's biblical to confuse the two. But trade unions in Britain, trade unions, were begun by Methodists and the influences of Methodism. They began as a Christian movement. Soon they became a purely socialist movement that was virtually run by atheists. Uh, began good, ended bad. So women's rights, the fact that a woman was paid less money for the same job as a male, or a woman would be denied a place in university to study a particular thing just because she was a woman, these were injustices. They hurt society. And I've seen when that gets into the church, it's also wrong, like the closed brethren. The way women are sequestered and suppressed it hurts the fellowship when women are not allowed to function. I've seen it go the other way. But because of what the Puritans did in sequestering women, or what the exclusive brethren do in sequestering women, now you've got the other side. The feminism of the world getting in. I know Christian medical doctors who are women, I know Christian lawyers, I know lawyers who are women, engineers who are women, and they're good at it. We just was in Scotland the other day, we had a young woman at our meeting, young woman, nice kid, well, young woman, she's comes in just in blue jeans and a, and a jacket and she just looks as plain and as ordinary. She's pretty, but she just looks simple, plain, ordinary as anybody. You'd never know who she was, but she is an autoimmunologist and one of the leading experts on AIDS in the United Kingdom, AIDS research. She's a doctorate in immunology and she's a leading scientist in this country, in, in Scotland, you know. Why should she be denied her position as a scientist if she had the intellect to do it? <laughs> I have no problem. Absolutely no problem. I went to university with women who made good doctors, good everything. No problem. Good teachers, good anything. But when I see a woman joining the fire brigade, I have a major problem. <laughs> In the United States, this actually happened. This actually happened. One of the tests to get into the fire brigade, they called the fire department in the States, in a major city, was they had a building made out of... <clears throat> ceramic materials that they could set on fire repeatedly and simulate a fire. And it was five stories tall, and they could pump semi-noxious or uh, low toxic uh, smoke into it to simulate conditions of, of inhalational difficulties and putting out a fire. Plus they set the building on fire and they raised the temperature. And part of the test in the fire brigade was they had a mannequin on the top of the five story, fifth story, that weighed 180 pounds. That's how much it weighed, 180 pounds, right? Approximately 88 kilos. And you had a stopwatch, and you had to take a hose, a hose that weighed over 100 kilos, and run up these stairs in this hot building, dressed like a fireman, full, full house pitch, full regalia, and run up, get this hose up there, and then pick up this mannequin and get this mannequin down the five flights of stairs within a certain amount of time time with the stopwatch. Because they reckon how long someone could die of asphyxiation, how much time you have to get the person down and to get the fire line up. And they had to pass the test. And all these guys, they were going to gymnasiums and all this stuff, working out, getting in shape, trying to pass this test. And if you didn't pass this test, you couldn't get it. But the feminist lobby stood in court successfully. They had to lower the standards so women could pass the test. Now that could cost somebody their life. That could kill somebody. When I see a woman climbing a telephone pole, what is there, war on? What's she doing up there? What's she trying to prove? That she's not attractive or like you're not attractive? Come down. This is craziness. 
Now, it happens because our societies have gone away from biblical principles. And now it's getting into the church. When this secular feminist mentality gets into the Christian church and women get into the pastoral position of being the senior pastor or senior elder, who are they manipulating control? Who should be the senior pastor and senior elder? Instead of advice, counsel, they, they begin calling the shots. Whenever that happens, if it happens in a marriage and the husband and father is not the head of the marriage, there's going to be problems in the marriage. And you see what happens. Women, who, men who are henpecked, the wives who henpeck them don't even like them or respect them. They really want another man, don't they? Women don't even respect their husbands if their husbands are allowed to be henpecked because women want security and they want to see somebody who's strong, stronger than they are. If they don't see it, they, they, they don't even like these guys. When this stuff gets into the church, there is going to be a barrier to fellowship. A barrier to fellowship because it's not functioning in God's order. Not only that, but the church is going to become vulnerable to seduction. There was a case, and it was absolutely an outrage. I will not name the place, I will not name the area of the country, the city, or the individuals, but this really happened. We had to begin a new fellowship in England, which I have to visit to. The reason is people left the church. I was denounced from the platform by the, by the pastor and the pastor's wife for my stand on the Toronto issue and all that. The wife was telling the husband what to do, and she got him into all this stuff, and Toronto, the Pensacola, and she was saying that the ones who wouldn't get down on the floor with her were grieving the Holy Spirit. Now, on at least two occasions, this woman became incontinent in church. She lost control of her bladder in church on at least two occasions, and she was saying the other women who wouldn't get down on the floor with her were, were grieving the Spirit. And her husband let this go on. He was a, he was a somebody that God he was a somebody that God minister. Well, they have four people left in the church. I tell them how much do they have left? Four. What do they expect? This actually happened. Now oh, that's an extreme case, but it happened. And then we picked up the pieces and helped the other people begin a new fellowship because they came to us for help, and we did that. This will always become a problem. The difference between male and female must be respected and those differences must be incorporated into the body life of the church. The idea that men can do this and do that and that men decide the way the clothes brethren do it, that is not scriptural. The women have no say about it, that is not scriptural. But the other side of the coin, what you see happening today with the feminism coming into the church, that is not scriptural either. Now this becomes a real issue among the Anglicans now, doesn't it? Some of them are going to the Catholic Church or the ordination of women. Before he went the unfortunate way he did, Tony Hickson, where it was like, he was an Anglican clergyman, he stood for a lot of good things in the, in the uh, C of E before he went into Toronto on that. He once told me, the issue we're facing is, he was a member of the Synod. On the ordination of women priests, it's ridiculous. The issue is not should we have women priests, but should we have priests? The Bible teaches the priesthood of all believers. He's right. He was right. Unfortunately, he lost his marbles, whatever happened to him, but he was right. He was a good guy. He was a good guy. He was right. Whenever this happens, you're going to have a barrier for fellowship. If the relationship and order of spiritual authority between male and female is not kept in the marriage, it's going to affect the marriage. And if it's not kept in God's order in the church, it's going to affect the church. Koinonia. A barrier to koinonia is not having the balance. However, if you do have the balance, if you do have the interdependence that we're urged to have in verse 11 of chapter 11, it'll be an asset to koinonia. When you have the interdependence, it's an asset. When you don't have that interdependence, it's a deficit. Let's continue. We've already talked about verse 19, the need for passion. When people fundamentally go away from biblical truth, it is the kind of division we are meant to have. But now we come to chapters 11 through 14. Normally, 
we break up Corinthians something like this. We say, well, chapter 11, at least right now, again, there were no chapters in the original Greek. Some places where they put the chapter division seemed like a good place. Other times, I think they could have, I personally think they could have been put elsewhere, according to the, the flow of thought and the subject. But, normally we say chapter 11 talks about the Lord's Supper. Chapter 12 talks about spiritual gifts. Chapter 13 talks about love. And then chapter 14 talks about gifts again. You normally break it up that way, and our thinking, and the way the, the text is usually exegeted, is usually done in that kind of line. I can understand why I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm simply saying, if we're going to do that, we first of all have to realize a letter is meant to be read as a letter. There is a natural continuity of theme from chapter 11 to the end of chapter 14. There is a relationship between what Paul says about the Lord's Supper, what he says about love, and what he says about spiritual gifts. Those things are all interrelated. They're all part of the same overall theme when you read it as a letter instead of breaking it up the way we normally do. Now, I'm not against breaking it up as long as we understand how the different components relate to each other. The early Christians met like this. The Nazarenes, the Jewish Christians, met on Saturday for Jewish worship, sometimes in, in the synagogue of unbelieving Jews. But then they'd meet on Sunday with believers, as believers. The Greek churches had a fellowship meal called an agape, from the Greek word for unconditional love. They were called love feasts. It's translated usually in your Bible, love feasts, in Jews' epistles. And they'd meet early in the morning on a Sunday, sometimes at sunrise. And they would have this meeting where they would have a reading of scripture, they would have fellowship, they would have worship, they would have prayer. But it would be centered around this fellowship meal called an agape or a love feast. And during the course of this love feast, they would have the breaking of bread, the Lord's Supper. Now, on our case of the Passover, we explain the symbolism of the Jewish Passover. It's not something I could even begin to approach in any depth. It wouldn't be appropriate to our subject if you want the deeper teaching in Corinthians on the Lord's Supper. You have to listen to the Passover taste. However, it is central to our worship and fellowship. Of all the churches I know, I would have to say the brethren, at least the open brethren, have the most scriptural understanding of the Lord's Supper and the Lord's Table. By far they're the best. Of all of what I've seen, they certainly have the most Hebraic and most Jewish understanding, and they have the most scriptural approach to it. At least the open brethren. Now, why? In the Jewish Passover, it commences with the Bebikat Hamet, the search for leaven. Turn with me, please, back to 1 Corinthians, Saints Epistle, chapter 5, verse 6. Again, there's far more to be said about the Lord's Supper than we can say now, and far more in Corinthians alone about the Lord's Supper, we can say now, I'm only dealing with it from the aspect of twin ears, okay? Verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 5, Your boasting is not good. Do you not know a little leaven leavens the entire lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened, for the Messiah, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Remember, this is a letter. He goes back and he picks up on what's in chapter 5 when he gets to chapter 11. In chapter 11, he talks about the Lord's Supper as a Jewish Passover. And he goes back and picks up what he, on what he already said about it in chapter 5. Chapter 5, your boasting is not good. 
Leaven contributes nothing in terms of nutrition to bread. It's just hot air that puffs up, doesn't it? As I've said in other tapes, pride is the kind of sin which undergirds and gives rise to other sins. When someone has a problem with uncontrollable anger, like I do, <coughs> underneath that is pride. When someone has a problem with grief, love and money, underneath that is pride. When someone has a problem with unchecked lust, underneath that is pride. Pride is the kind of sin that begets and gives rise to other sin. It's the first thing. Satan's first sin was pride, he wanted to be God. Adam and Eve's first sin was pride, you can be like that. Apart from through Jesus, that a law to yourself, a Satan beguiles them. Jesus had no pride. Hence, the Passover Moscow was told by the rabbis corresponds to the flesh of the land. And the master had to be striped, has to be striped, according to Jewish law, striped and pierced. By his stripes we are healed, he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was broken for our sins. God was broken for us. That's the nature of Moscow. No leaven. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. False doctrine. Jesus had no false doctrine. False doctrine is sin. Leaven is a picture of sin, particularly pride, and is a picture of false doctrine. False doctrine is sin, and false teachers, those who teach false doctrine, are people with a pride problem. When you see these guys teaching this stuff, you see pride. That's why Paul says, they exceed what is written, they become Okay. It all ties in the overall context of the letter. It's back to the same basic ideas. The Passover beginning by purging leaven. You can't come to the Savior until the leaven has been removed from the house. The very fact of that. Again, it comes from Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 12. You can get the Passover tape or video and I explain the whole thing. And Arnold Spookerbaum and Chris Hill also have pretty good tapes on Passover as well. There's tapes you can listen and it goes through all the things. Okay. Before we come to the Lord's table, we have to purge the leaven. This is usually not done. In fact, it's very strange. Remember? Chapter 10, learn from the Hebrews or you'll make the same mistakes. What do Christians usually do? We're going to give you a chance to give your life to Jesus. Everyone put your head down. Everyone put your head down. Nobody's going to see but God is in the, in the preacher. If you want to accept Jesus, just put your head down. People close their eyes and nobody sees who's going to get saved. <laughs> So what did they get that? You know, I've, I've lost a lot of my confidence in the recent years, but for years Billy Graham faithfully preached the gospel, and he always used to say, Jesus called people publicly, he was right. Public declaration, baptism is a public declaration of faith. This idea of putting your head down is not crazy. When should Christians put their head down? Before we take the Lord's Supper, we need to hear what the leaven asks the Lord. Paul says, let a man first examine himself. If we take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, we can keep judgment onto ourselves and drink judgment onto ourselves. People can become physically ill and people can actually die. Now this is not to be confused with the Roman Catholic idea of the Mass and the mortal sin of sacrilege and all that stuff. But it is to say that it's more than just bread and it's more than just wine. It's a memorial of the Lord and a testimony to his return. It's the centerpiece of our fellowship and our identity with each other in him. Purging of the leaven. Now, again, after this, in chapter 5, what does Paul talk about? What do you have to do with judging outside of us and judge the saints? If we allow people with irrepentance immorality in their lives to take the Lord's Supper with us. We can bring judgment on the body, at least on them as members of the body, because they've not discerned the Lord's body and blood, it says in Corinthians 11. They don't discern his body and blood, and judgment comes. The Lord's table is for baptized believers who are walking with Jesus. 
look at the epistle to Jude. Verse 12, these men are those who are hidden reefs in your love seat. When they feast with you, that's when they come to the fellowship meal where the Lord's supper was taken, without fear. They don't care. They're not afraid of God. Caring for themselves when it describes where they are. We have a tape on Jude with the Midrash of Jude. Jude is the spiritual example of Midrash as literary genre in the New Testament. Their blemishes on your love feast. They defile the Lord's table. Again, unconfessed in immorality in the fellowship are barriers to fellowship. But they're more than barriers to fellowship. They obstruct and defile the very centerpiece of our fellowship, which is the breaking of bread. Why is it the centerpiece of our fellowship? We are here for one reason, even today, and one reason only. What the Lord Jesus did for us when he became a man and took our sin by Christ and rose from the dead to give us eternal life. That's the only reason we're here. The only reason we have a future is because He's going to come back to us. The only reason we have a future. Because what He did for us, this is what He's going to do for us. It's like true redemption. Remember, lift up your head, your redemption draws near. It's a future thing, it's a past thing, it's also a present thing. When Jewish people take the Pesach, the Passover Seder, again, this is on the Passover tape, you can listen. They are looking back and they are looking forward. They are looking back when at the Hebrew month of Nisan, they were delivered from Egypt, the first exemption. But they are looking forward when they believe at the Hebrew month of Nisan, roughly April, the Messiah would come and deliver from sin. Jews look back, and they look forward. When we take the Lord's Supper, it is the same thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, once again, let's look at it. Verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, I'm scared that he comes. You proclaim his death, we're looking back to what he did for us, until he comes. We're looking forward to what he's going to do for us. The Lord's Supper is a memorial of what he did, Lord, I don't know. Those who are do this remembrance of me. Not the man, it's not the same as God, we have to say, once and for all. Until he comes, the Lord's daughter is not going to be a testimony of what he did for us. A commemoration, a remembrance of what he did. It is our testimony to what he's going to do. In other words, it is the appetizer of the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation and in the Song of Solomon. It's a foretaste of what we're going to do in eternity when we recline with the Lord. Remember the apostles asked him, Lord, who's going to recline at your left and who's going to recline at your right? Because the apostles understood that somehow eternity was like a Passover Seder. The marriage supper of the Lamb who's going to be sitting close to Jesus in eternity. That's the energy. It's essential to our fellowship. Now something began to happen. The Reformed churches totally messed this up in the Reformation. They were reacting against the deceptions of medieval Roman Catholicism and the, 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 the abomination of the Mass, which says that Jesus has to die again and again and again, contrary to Hebrews. Now, we have Kashrut and Salmon, we deal with the subject of the Mass and Kashrut and Salmon, we copy the case. So, the reformers, a lot of them said, we'll only have the Lord's Supper on certain occasions. Four times a year. Some only have, some, some Protestant churches only to take the Lord's Supper once a year. Simply because the Roman Catholics had corrupted it with the Mass, so therefore, we're going we're to get rid of it. Or at least get rid of it to the extent possible. That's terrible. Satan only counterfeits that it is worth counterfeiting. It's like the gifts of the Spirit. Why is there Toronto and Pensacola and 7 Up, whatever it is this week? He only counterfeits things worth counterfeiting. If it wasn't a real thing, he wouldn't worry about a counterfeit. The Lord's Supper is essential to our fellowship and our worship. If we take it in an unworthy manner, it is bad. And if we let others take it in an unworthy manner, it is bad and it is an obstruction of the fellowship. We become one body when we take it. We are his body. 
The Lord's Supper should be taken, I'm convinced from the scriptures weekly, at least as often as you do this. And of course, they gave some Jehovah's Witnesses say they won't do it at Passover. It should be regular, it should be frequent, it should be central, and it should be the high point of our worship and fellowship. High point. Everything else goes up to it. Think of the Jewish Passover meal. At a Jewish Passover, you come in and you have a Seder. And it takes about three hours. Now you have a big Bible teaching in it called the Haggadah. A big Bible teaching called the Haggadah, which is the telling of the story of Exodus, basically. And you have all these children's games and, and, and children's programs within the Haggadah. They search for the leaven and all this stuff, you know. So the children's program. And there's a lot of prayers and worship. You sing, Remember the night and you just sing it and they all get charged up. All the worship, all the singing, all the prayers, all the children's programs, all this other stuff leads up to one thing. To eating them here. And so it's supposed to be when we take the Lord's Supper. The worship, the teaching of the scriptures, the fellowship, the children's program, everything should be leading up to <laughs> Out there is the world, in here is where we're going. This is the fellowship of the rescue, of the people who are, who are going to get out of here. Our future is not out there. That place is going to Gehenna. In here is the, the, the fellowship. We're here to meet about where we're going to spend stuff. <laughs> That's what this is about. What we came out of and where we're going. And central to that is the Lord's Supper. Now again, the root side of the root, the church root is part of the people root, and it gets everything else that gets to go wrong as a result. You forget where you came from, and you're sure going to forget where you're going. You lose sight of where you came from, you're going to lose sight of where you're going. That's what, that is part of the reason why, just before this in chapter 10, Paul tells the church not to lose its Jewish root, because they have a very westernized understanding of fellowship. Think of the Jewish Passover Seder. Now again, I don't want to go into this anymore, but we've got the tapes. You can listen to the tapes and explain the whole spiel. Bearing in mind, Unless we have a right understanding of the Lord's table, we are not going to have a right understanding of fellowship. No point in it. Now if we go into chapter 12 to 14, where we talks about it. I don't want to believe this anymore of the midrash of the body and what the eye and what the foot is got to take. We have Five tapes on the gift of the Spirit back there. If you're interested in that subject, get the tape. Today, once again, only as so far as it concerns Koinonia. But what do you have? Suppose you have a body and an eyeball or stuff of a knife. <laughs> and you have a hand at the end of a leg. It would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? Is the whole body eyes, the whole body hands? No. No. For a body to be healthy and functional, each member must know what it is and what it has to do in relation to the other members under the head of Christ. Again, get the case. I've lamented and complained time and time again. Now today we're dealing with Koinonia, the Hebrew concept of fellowship. But we have a case called Abraham's Journey where we deal with Hitabru, the Hebrew concept. And we talk about on that case, now the two complement each other. On the Abraham's Journey case, we talk about how in our church, 10, 15, say 15% of the people at most, 15% of the people, or doing 85% of the training. 
15% of the people do 85% of the giving. 15% of the people do 85% of the witnessing. And 15% of the people do 85% of the ministry. Worse still, in middle class Christianity, is the idea of the paid professional. He went to seminary, he went to Bible college, he's the pastor, that's what we pay him for. He'll preach the gospel for the lost, he'll do this, he'll do that, he'll do the other thing. In fact, biblically, as the shepherd, his task is to help others to discover and develop their own gifts. But instead of having a body, you wind up with something like this. Scripturally, the church may be compared to a symphony orchestra. Paul talks about this, about giving undistinguishable sounds in a battle and things like this. So picture a Philharmonic Orchestra, a big symphony in London or New York or something like that, or Vienna. And you have a conductor. He's not playing an instrument. Now he knows how to play any instrument in the orchestra. He knows how to play practically, he knows how to play any instrument. He may not play them as well as he may not play a symphony as well as a symphonist, but he may not play a cello as well as a cello, but he still knows how to play it. And he knows harmonic theory. He knows about G pentatonic major, and then there's, you know, then the second violin goes to F diminished and all this. He knows all this stuff. He knows that these instruments have to do in relation to each other. Right there. Right? And he conducts. Well, suppose you bought a ticket and you went to a concert to hear, uh, you know, to hear I'm trying not to use this by no part of something, right? And they went to a, a, a symphony hall, right? Yeah. And going to hear Tchaikovsky or Mozart or whatever, or Haydn or whatever you like, and you go in there, and, and the orchestra hit all the seats for them. But then the conductor comes out, wearing his tuxedo, and he goes, and then he runs down, and he goes, I don't care how good a musician he is. I don't care if he's a prodigy. I don't care if he went to Juilliard. I don't care if he's Dave Holden, Bach, and John Bowen one. It's going to be the worst rendition of the Ode to Joy you've ever heard in your life. <laughs> but that's what happens in churches. The members do not function in unity with each other as members. Remember Matthew 25, he gave each a talent and wants to return his investment. There was an investor and an interest bearer, but the one who neither has brought interest or invested, who just buried his talent, he just said, get lost, those people are back to him. Now I'm not talking about a newly saved person, but people that have been in the church a while, don't know their gifts or their ministries, that is a problem. And that's what you've got. A barrier to koinonia. When people are not being encouraged to discover and develop their own gifts. When the body is not a ministry, ministering organ in itself. When the members are not doing the ministry and leave everything up to the pastor. That is an obstruction to fellowship. It is not body life. Why should you believe it? you got a church, you got a church. Let me call the city you got a pastor, you got a rabbi. Marvels, you got a church, you got a mosque. You got a pastor, you got an imam. Where's our testimony? There's no testimony. They have to see a living organism where the members function in unity with each other and harmony with each other. When this fails to happen, you are going to have anything but coin and aid. But let's take this a bit further. We're looking now at chapter 12. Verse 12. Verse 11. But one and the same Spirit works all things, distributing to each one individually, just as He will. I want to play the violin. Yeah, but you better at cello. No, I want to play the violin. I want to teach the Sunday school. Wait a minute, then I'll 
the Lord has gifted you to music ministry. Yeah, but I want to teach you some of this. It says the Lord wills. It says the Lord loves me. I wish we could do His will, then it would become our will. You won't regret it. But let's look what happens. Verse 24, Whereas our seemly members have no need of it, but God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacks. Now, what he obviously does is he compares genitalia to the lower members. It's considered the Greek title was considered in the what they're doing. But if people did not have sex organs, they wouldn't have people. <laughs> That's what he's basically saying. Right? You wouldn't have sex organs, you wouldn't have people. You wouldn't have sex organs, you wouldn't have people. Just like you were, I'm only a this, I'm only a that. <laughs> I'm not a hand, I'm not an eye, I'm not a nose. I'm just an interstitial cell in an ovary. Yeah, but you didn't have interstitial cells, you didn't have any people with hands and eyes and It's that mentality. That, that, that view is from your cross. When you see people jealous of other people's gifting, that is a barrier to such. What does he say? If the ears should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body, if I can't read the women's prayer group, I'm not going to do this. That's what it comes to. Somebody's gifting. When we, when we appear before Jesus, He's not going to judge us on what our gift was. He's going to judge us on how faithful we use the gift He gave us. Doesn't matter if you're the pastor, doesn't matter if you're the prophet, doesn't matter if you're the Bible teacher, doesn't matter if you sweep the church steps. If that's what God has called you to do and you do it for His glory, it's that reward you're going to get as high as any pastor, as high as any evangelist. When we get to heaven, we're going to find out who's who and lots of what. Guys with big mouth and a bit of chutzpah like me don't need anything. Faithfulness means something. Faithfulness to Jesus means everything. Something to do with what the gift is. It's how faithful we are to the gift. You have a mother with a handicapped child? Taking care of that baby. That's what God has called her to. That's all God wants. Faithfulness. That's all He wants. He doesn't call us to be successful as man counts success. He calls us to be faithful. Now, jealousy in the ministry and being jealous of another person's ministry every time will be a barrier to fellowship. People will be motivated by resentment of each other and all this, the other thing. Let God put you in a position. Let God put you in a position. Try to get in the groove he wants you. Now again, I don't want to go into this, but listen to the tape trying to get to the Spirit. In chapter 13, another barrier to fellowship. Let's begin in verse 9. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, that when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. When I was a child, I used to speak as a child, think as a child, reason as a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in the mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I also shall know fully, just as I also have been fully known. Now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. The next barrier to koinonia, the next barrier to fellowship, Cessation theology. Cessation. The idea that the gifts of the Spirit ended with the apostles and have no future meaning. They argue on basically two grounds. The first, and both come from first Corinthians. Jews seek the sign. Well, in the early church, God was only working on the Jews and they needed a sign. Greeks need wisdom, so we don't need these signs anymore. 
What, are there any less Jews around now who need saving than there was in the early church? I've been an evangelist of the Jews for 20 years. I've led a lot of Jews to Christ. How do they reckon it ended? It's in the same argument. Secondly, what do they do about the fact that in the book of Acts and the epistles, these same signs and wonders were done among Gentiles, among non Jews? Their other argument comes from this chapter 13. We prophesy in part that the purpose is going to come. And they argue that the perfect is the New Testament canon. The perfect is gone. Now, that means when John wrote Revelation, it means when the New Testament canon was finally agreed and, and formalized officially in Nicaea, when, when was that? They're not exactly agreed among themselves at the time when that was. The fact is, after the apostles, the pre nicene fathers made it clear that these same signs and wonders continued among both Jew and Gentile. No historical basis, and even less of a biblical. When I was a child, I did the things of a child, so the gifts of the Spirit are for children. Now we're grown up, now the perfect is coming, the perfect is the Bible, the New Testament. So they say. Well, what do they do with Acts chapter 2 that says these phenomena that happened on Pentecost would have to happen in the last days? That's just one question. What do they do that Romans 11 says that there will be an influx of Jews into the church again in the last days? Another question. But let's just deal with Corinthians. If the perfect has come, look at verse 13. Only love is going to endure forever, but now faith, hope, and love. These three abide with the greatest of love. If only the love endures forever, then if the perfect has come, what do we need hope and faith for? <laughs> Their argument is totally asegetical. If the perfect has come, if the perfect is the New Testament, we don't need hope and we don't need faith. If the perfect has come. <laughs> I haven't heard them arguing against faith and, and, and hope. It's a silly argument. What are they doing? First Corinthians 4, 6. Exceeding the things which are written. It is not only charismatic and Pentecostals who do that. The hyper-charismatic and hyper-Pentecostals. The Satanists and Reformed people have been doing it for generations. The Satan theology, the erroneous belief that the gift of the Spirit ended with the apostles, that they're not going to appear again in the last days, that God is finished with it, well, it's simply not on. Now, I don't want to go into it, I'm only going to mention it in passing, we've dealt with it in other tapes, but very briefly look at Romans 11. Verse 19, I'm sorry, verse 29 of Romans 11, the gift and calling of God are irrevocable. Why does Paul use this verse, putting gift and calling? He's talking about God's calling of Israel. So why does he begin connecting Israel with gifts? Because Jews seek a sign? Yes, that's part of the reason. But in the next chapter, 12, it's about gifts of the Spirit, isn't it? In other words, those who say God is finished with the gifts are the same ones who are going to say God's finished with the Jew. <laughs> There's a direct link between supersessionism, between replacement theology and cessationism. There's a direct link, and it comes from the strong Reformed Church tradition. The strong Calvinist, not all Calvinists, but the strong Calvinistic tradition, which links which the Church of the New Israel with no future purpose of the Jews and the gift of the Spirit of God. Now you can understand why they get into some of this. In the Middle Ages, when the Reformation came, you had all these bogus claims of miracles. The same thing you see happening with Benny Hinn, all that this stuff in Morris Cirillo, that was going on in medieval Catholicism. And the Reformers reacted against the corruption associated with it. But it was the same old argument. Because of the counterfeit, it needed to be real. Foolish argument. Totally foolish. Cessation theology is a barrier to fellowship. If you're telling people that these charismatic gifts don't exist anymore, well, how are they going to know if they're an eye, a foot, or a hand? How are they going to know if they play the tuba or the trombone? The charismatic gifts are given to equip people for their ministry of gifts. 
Verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 12. There are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. But before that, in verse 4, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. The gifts equip people for their ministry. Now we talk about this in the gifts of the Spirit case. A pastor, for instance, is called to know the condition of his flock. A shepherd must know the condition of his sheep. Very frequently then, a pastor will have the gift of the word of knowledge. Hey, that person in your church is into something that's wrong, or this person's having this kind of trial. In order to help a pastor, a shepherd, to know the condition of the sheep, very frequently a pastor will have the gift of the word of knowledge, as one example. The gift equip people for the ministry. You know what it's like doing? Sensationalism is like sending an army to war with no bullets. That's what it is. It's like sending an army to war with no bullets. It is just as bad and unbalanced on one extreme as is charismania and experiential theology on the other. People basing doctrines on feelings and experience. Both, in order to justify what they're doing, both the hyper-charismatics on one extreme and the cessationists on the other must do something that Paul said them. They must exceed the things that are exceeded. And again, when you do that, a barrier to fellowship will always come. And that's what you see in chapter 13. Look, look at chapter 14. In verse 15 of chapter 14, he says, what is the outcome? And in verse 26, he says, what is the outcome? He uses that Greek phrase twice, what is the outcome? In other words, what is the result of the sum total of what precedes it? Let's look at the first of these things. Verse 15, what's the outcome? What precedes it in verse 14 is this. I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Unfruitful. Therefore, I'll be like a barbarian to the one who speaks, and the one who speaks to me, that all things be done for edification. I want to pray with my spirit, and I want to pray with my mind. That is the outcome. Spirit and mind. I pray with the spirit, I pray with my mind also. I sing with my spirit, I shall sing with the mind also. Charismatic or charismania. Somehow, critical thought, I don't mean critical in the sense of fault finding, but I mean critical in the sense of being objectively analyzing and discerning something on the basis of scripture. Popular charismania and hyper-pentecostalism says, forget your mind, just let the spirit have his way. When you forget your mind and let the spirit have his way, the first thing that's going to happen is an alien spirit will be an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Now we have other tapes on, on the Toronto thing explaining this. This idea that with the mind and with the spirit are mutually exclusive is ridiculous. They're not mutually exclusive. They are mutually complementary and interdependent. Look at verse 29 of chapter 14. Let two or three prophets speak of the other's past judgment. Judgment, think, work it through. The notion that the spiritual and what to do with your spirit, what to do with your mind, are empty. The natural mind, no, the natural man, we have a supernatural mind. All human faculties are consecrated to God's service. Sanctified human wisdom. Operating in the basis of God's word. In conjunction with the gifts of the spirit, the two go in harmony. When you have the separation of the mind and the spirit, that is Eastern mysticism. That's what Hinduism teaches. That's what Buddhism teaches. Just empty yourself and let the stuff come in. But now if we read books like the Fourth Dimension by Young E. Chow, or if listen to the teaching of the, of the Vineyard Cult, it's coming into the church. It's just not scripture. The mind and the spirit go together. Spirit and truth. The mind and the spirit. Now, I don't want to get into all the cults that we got tape on. I'm only dealing with it insofar as establishing that when this happens, it'll be a barrier to fellowship. But now, the second outcome. 
Verse 26, what is the second outcome? What precedes it? Once again, verse 24, the ungifted enters, or the unbeliever. Gifts of the Spirit are to be practiced in such a manner as the unsaved will want to get saved, and the ungifted will want to get gifted. We've said this many times. But now let's look at the verse itself, 26. What's the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one of you has a psalm, a teaching, a revelation, a song, and an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Now we've got to go back to chapter 11. Remember, it's a continuity. It's a natural flow of it. It's the same theme. This was a fellowship meal. When your church has a fellowship meal, you have a sign-up list, don't you? This person is going to make a tuna fish casserole. This person is going to prepare a salad. This person is going to bake a cake. And this person is going to organize drinks. Right. So next Sunday, our church is going to have a fellowship meal. Here's the sign-up list. Charlie is going to organize drinks. Jennifer is going to bake a cake and so on. Now, do Charlie and Jennifer just get out of bed Sunday morning? Brush their teeth, get ready for church, and go downstairs. Push the button and look in the microwave, and lo and behold, there's the casserole. It just appears. So they open the refrigerator and run out. Here's the sound. So Jennifer opens the oven, and there is a nice chocolate cake. No, it doesn't work that way. Those things must be prepared, right? Well, he says, if the fellowship meal is the same, and you bring something from the Lord. When we have these meetings where people should bring things according to their gifts, does anyone have a song? Or does the Lord give you that song? Or can we sing number 26? Can we sing number 113? No, I'm not against that, but that's not what it's talking about. Each one of you has a son, has a teaching, a revelation. Son, oh, why don't you get this? The people really see God. Lord, what am I going to bring? Well, you're going to have a fellowship meal. You're going to bring a cake. You're going to bring a salad. You're going to bring a casserole, right? Well, the spiritual food is the same. You're going to bring a tongue. You're going to bring an exhortation, you're going to bring a testimony, you're going to bring a prophecy. What is the Lord giving you to bring it according to what you're gifted? But instead of people seeking the Lord, what they're going to do is just show up and just send and buy with some waffles. Some jerk runs around, I'm taking the position to see what people work on all this kind of stuff. And they think that's what they're doing. They think it's a body ministry. Somebody stands up and says something is in his head, he's a lot of rubbish. Have those persons thought the Lord about that stuff? What are they doing? It's the same thing. It's a fellowship meal. They're expecting the cake to pop out of the oven. They're expecting the microwave door to open up and there's going to be a casserole. It's going to mystically appear, miraculously appear. That's not like that. That's not how a fellowship meal is and that's not how fellowship is. When you have these silly ideas, it's a barrier to fellowship. You bring something to a fellowship meal. You bring food. You bring physical food. And you bring spiritual food. You have to prepare what you're going to bring to eat or drink. And you have to prepare what you want others to eat or drink. If that doesn't happen, there'll be no fellowship. There'll be no corner meal. There'll be pandemonium. What you see today is not corner meal. What you see today is too often pandemonium. Now, if people are really seeking God about what they should bring, the prophecy comes, that prophecy is going to be a lot more likely to be real and happen. That teaching is going to edify. That hymn is really going to honor the Lord and, 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 and encourage people. But they're just showing up. You know what it's like? 
You ever watch little girls? I used to watch my daughter when she was a little girl, and she'd have all of her, one of her friends over something, and they'd have some dolls sitting around at children, like a, a, a make-believe dining room table, with little plastic dishes and plastic cups and plastic things. And it was make-believe food and make-believe drinks, and they'd give them the dolls to drink, and it was just make-believe that it was real. Now, as far as those little girls were concerned, they were imitating their mothers, and it, and it was for them it was real. They did the things of a child, because they're children. No problem for kids. That's no good for us. They're having make-believe food. They're like the little girls with the, with the plastic dishes and the make-believe food. It's not even real. That's what they're bringing to church. That's what their so-called visions and prophecies and words are. This was the fellowship meal. Chapter 15. The next diary of the fellowship. Chapter 15 is centered on two things. The hope of the resurrection. In the Bible, hope is future fact. Hope is future fact in it. Again, it naturally flows from the Lord's Supper. We're going to heaven. We're going to be with Jesus. We're going to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We take a testimony of what He did, but an appetizer of what He's going to do. So, from this, naturally would come the idea of the resurrection. Today we find far and far less emphasis in popular Christian circles with the two things dealt with most in this chapter. The gospel and eternity. Eternity is under threat by the annihilationists on one hand, we can't be sure that hell is the place of eternal judgment. This is the place of annihilation. I mean, the whole idea is put forth, proposed by Roger Forster and John Stott and these people. We can't be sure hell is an actual place of eternal conscious damnation. It's the annihilation. And on the other hand, it's dominionism, kingdom now. Instead of thy kingdom come, it's thy kingdom has come. And it's us, it's our movement, it's, we're going to take dominion. Chapter 15 is under threat. You find far less teaching about eternity and the coming of Christ and our hope in the resurrection and more on this kingdom, dominion, over-realized eschatology, triumphalism, the whole bit. The things that you see in the March for Jesus and all that. But you also see far less teaching of the gospel. You just look at the average hymn books of, of these movements, vineyard hymn books, for instance. Of 88 hymns, only three mention the themes of the blood of the cross. There is far, far less emphasis on the Gospel. Chapter 15 of the Resurrection and the Gospel. The early church had three kinds of preaching or teaching. One was the doctrine. The doctrine was expository or doctrinal Bible teaching. The other was hamelia. We get the word homily, exhortation. And the third was charisma, preaching the Gospel to the unsaved. Now, there's been a problem among our Baptist and Brethren friends for a long time. They preach the gospel faithfully every Sunday night and you're already saved. And have done for years. You think they're being faithful. Jesus would go out. <laughs> we'll go out and invite them in to hear the gospel. It's no good doing preaching the gospel because you're already saved every Friday or every Sunday night or whatever. But you just look. You've got these academics now like Paul Kennedy. And they're trying to basically water down the gospel and redefine it, saying we're taking the gospel out of the language of the courtroom, we're putting it into the language of the family sitting room. We're, instead of God as judge, God as heavenly father. Now, the trial of Jesus, God uses the forum of, of, of the judicial proceeding for a reason. He was put on trial in our place. An innocent man was condemned at that trial so the guilty ones could walk out the door. That was us. It was for a reason that God used the judicial format. Okay? They get rid of it. You can't know God as Father until you first realize He's the judge. Half a gospel. Half a gospel. Paul says, I did not shrink back from declaring the whole purpose of God. These guys only give the half. What do you have today? A watered down gospel. Put your hand up. Jesus loves you. Accept it into your heart. God wants to bless you. 
There's no talk about repentance and stuff like this. Very, at least comparatively little of a changed life. Now, early Pentecostalism was not like that. Their whole emphasis was this power in the blood of the Lamb and all this stuff. Would you be free of your burden of sin? This power in the blood. That's what they wanted about. They had the gifts. They had the gifts. But it was the gifts as you have in Hebrews, chapter 2. For God also bearing witness with them by signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts of the Spirit, bearing witness to the, to the gospel. But it was never this experience, signs, wonders, manifestation thing. Again, I talked about this to Abdul in the faith. I don't want to go into it, but look at chapter 7, verse 22. Many will come to me, many. Lord, do we not do this in your name and cast out demons and prophesy and do miracles? And before you talk to me, I never knew you. I never knew you. Many people in the charismatic movement, many people, even in mainstream evangelical churches that have preached cheap grace and put your hands up without explaining repentance in the law of God, have never been truly saved. There are many people who are accepted as brethren in Christ or sisters in Christ who have never truly been born again. I'm convinced. Jesus said, I never knew you. They joined the movement. And they, they have, of course, they see the signs, wonders, manifestations. They think that somehow that proves it. No, the signs, wonders, that, that proves Jesus. They don't prove us. I never knew you. Two barriers to koinonia. A lot of preaching about the resurrection and our eternal destiny in favor of some kind of a hope in this world, apart from millennia. And second, a diminished emphasis on preaching an unmitigated gospel. A gospel of love. Unless you understand the gospel of justice, there's no gospel you won't understand the love. That, that, that we're so guilty and, 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 and so absolutely, totally condemned before a holy and perfect God that he becomes a man and, and takes the blame for what we did. Unless we understand his justice and his wrath, we'll never understand his real love. He did that for us. Why should he do that? Why should Jesus Christ save me? Why should God become a man to die for me? When we say personal Savior, we just don't mean you accept him personally. Personal Savior means if you or I were the only person who ever sinned, he would have had to come down and go through the whole same thing just for you or just for me. He took the sins of the world, but God laid out all of our sin on him. If he's my personal Savior, that means I accepted him personally, yes, but it means much more than that. It means if I was the only person who ever sinned, he would have had to go through the whole thing, the cross and all of it. What well, it means, the resurrection, all of it, just for me, just for you. This stuff is not pushed, it's not proclaimed anymore. And they're just trying to accommodate the world. You can't please God and man. But they're trying to please man. They have everything from neon light evangelism, to rock music evangelism, to this smoke machine evangelism, everything but the cross. Now, I'm not against bringing that stuff into the world, bringing the gospel into the world by those means, but when I see those means being brought into the church, it definitely bothers me. Let's look at the next chapter, 16. One last point about fellowship. Conserving the collection for the saints. I often quote a famous rabbi. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, or where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. As the ants say, put your money where your mouth is. Jesus said, there are few things going to tell more about your real relationship with the Lord and what your hope is and your attitude towards money. It's not how much you give or what percentage you give, it's your attitude towards what you have. It's not mine, it belongs to you, Lord. How do you want me to budget it? I'm only a steward. That's the attitude. The attitude is if I'm slapped broke, I'm a co heir with Christ, I'm rich, and if I'm rich, I'm slapped broke, but God's not mine. That's the attitude. The love of money is the root of all kind of evil. Those longing for it will wander from the faith. But today the faith teachers teach the opposite. The Bible says, you, you, you come chasing the love of riches, you're going to lose yourself. 
Our attitude towards money will show more about our attitude towards Jesus than anything else with the possible exception of our prayer life and our walk. It's going to tell, tell the most. You just look at it. Christians that will spend more money on unnecessary luxury items than they will missions or, or the, the, just the upkeep of their own church or evangelism. People that will spend exorbitant amounts of money on this, but with no thought to, 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 to the starving masses or to the Christians being persecuted, or, or even to the financial needs of their own pastor and his family, is that he's supposed to, pennies are going to fall from heaven? This is wrong. When I see people putting a, a pound, now again, the widow's might. most mission money and mission budgets. You know the money we send to Israel. You know where most of it comes from? Not from wealthy Christians. It's the old lady sending you five pounds, sending this to Israel, giving you pensions. She doesn't have that five quid to give. That five quid in the site, in my sight, is fifty. From somebody, it's like me giving fifty. And it's, and, and, and God, it's a God. It's like somebody is, is five hundred. But she didn't have it. That five means a lot more than a fifty or a five hundred in God's way of looking at me. But that's her heart. She's not giving her five pounds, she's giving herself. She doesn't have that five pounds. And when I see these money preachers exploiting people's goodness, the goodness of God's people, people of kind giving hearts, these money preachers taking that money away from where it should go, it really makes me angry. The attitude towards money. When I see people, when an old lady will just buy, she doesn't have that, but some middle class businessman will put in five or ten when he should be. <laughs> this is wrong. I've often said, would you, would you eat at McDonald's and pay the bill at Burger King? It says in Corinthians, what does it say? Those, look at Deuteronomy chapter 5, about don't muzzle the ox when it's threshing. This is quoted by Paul, again in 1 Corinthians. Sorry, it's Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4. Do not muzzle an ox when the ox is muzzling. Now in 1 Corinthians 9, 9, he picks this verse up. Those who work hard. So the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel get their living from the gospel. If people, as far as it's funny to show yourselves the truth, you look at these ministers, some of them, you know how many churches there are in, in, in the Pentecostal and charismatic movements particularly where the minister will stand up and he goes, I'm just going to share what's on my heart. <laughs> week after week he's giving you some experience for what he believes God is saying to him but there's no exposition of scripture. And that guy's getting paid. Now the Bible says it's those who work hard at teaching and teaching the word of God and study the soul themselves approved. Now, once in a while, God gives some guy a message or a word. That's okay. But when you see these guys who consistently stand up, I'm going to share what's on my heart. You know why he's sharing what's on his heart? Because there's nothing in his head. <laughs> Cucumber sandwiches and tea are okay. Well, when an emergency happens and something happened and we couldn't get dinner ready, we just have to get by with a standard chain, no problem. That can happen to anybody. But week after week, this is what the feeding people, they're charging them for a steak dinner. <laughs> this is crazy. I see hard-working ministers who love the sheep, who work hard at teaching and teaching the Word of God, not being taken care of financially. And I see other guys who are just hustlers and high fathers, talking a lot of rubbish going around in big cars and, and, and living the life of a king, and they, <laughs> which they would never get in the secular world. It's terrible. Would you eat in McDonald's and pay the bill in Burger King? You pay the bill when you get fed, don't you? you do me a favor. If you're not fed today, don't contribute anything to the ministry. Don't. Don't. If you're just not meeting your needs, you shouldn't, you shouldn't pay the bill. 
Our attitude towards money, our attitude towards giving, it's not, it may have something to do in relation to your means with percentages or amounts. It may. But it's more than it's attitude. It's attitude. When there is a wrong attitude towards giving, and that goes both ways. When these con men and these hype artists come up and they whip people up and give all these crazy visions and dreams and lay hands on people and go on them and take up a big collection and send the people out hungry. That's the wrong attitude towards money and it's a barrier to fellowship. But when people will teach the word of God faithfully and equip the saints and they walk away with a cab fare at home, that's a barrier to fellowship. There's a balance. Once again, people will forever, so maybe a gun can never be there. Spirit and food. I've been going on about this for years, some years. I see two things happening too often. Over here, I see people who have an openness to the Spirit. Over here, I see people who have a diligence in seeking the biblical truth. Over here, I see Pentecostals and Charismatics. Over here, I see brethren and Baptists and Free Church Evangelicals. Over here, I see people who really want to see God move in power, but they simply do not have the knowledge and understanding for it to happen. Over here, I also see people who want to see God move in power, but they're afraid of the power, even though they have the knowledge and the understanding. Over here, I see charismania. Over here, I often see cessationism. Over here, I find people who are really interested in the power of God's Spirit moving in a fellowship. And that's what they really want to happen. They want lively worship. They want to see signs and wonders and miracles. And over here, I see other people saying, wait a minute. That's not signs and wonders and miracles. That's Toronto. That's Pensacola. That's your signs and we don't want it. I see the ones who are over here and I see the ones who are over here. But in the middle, there's a gap. And not many Christians, and not many churches, and not many ministers are filling that gap. It's not what's over here, and it's not what's over here. You see, Satan doesn't like what's over here. He doesn't like it. But he's not afraid of it. Because it doesn't have too much power. He doesn't like what's over here either. He doesn't like it. But he's not afraid of it. Because they don't have too much wisdom or understanding or knowledge. The last thing in the world he wants to see is that gap being filled. Not spirit, not truth, but spirit and truth. Over here and over here. As long as some of us are over here, things are not going to get any better. And as long as some of us are over here, things are not going to get any better. But in the middle, something is missing. When that's no longer missing, things will get better. What is it? 
koinonia. Fellowship. God bless the telegram.